Hello, Dr. Metzger here. We're going to read Duke Ellington today. And while we're reading it, we're going to talk about or listen for similes and metaphors. So simile is comparing two things that aren't anyway the same, but they're comparing them that they are the same using the words like or as. So listen to any words, any comparisons that use like or as. And a metaphor is comparing two things without using like or as. So let's see how we, many we can find. And as I read it, I'm going to stop and point them out. So here we go. Uh, let's see. You ever hear of the jazz playing man, the man with the cats who could swing with his band? He was born in 1899 in Washington, D.C., born Edward Kennedy Ellington. But whenever young Edward went, he said, hey, call me Duke. Duke's name fit him rightly. He was a smooth-talking, slick-stepping, piano-playing kid. But his piano-playing wasn't always as breezy as his stride. That is a simile because it is comparing how he is walking or how he's act his stride as being breezy. So that is a simile. When Duke's mother, Daisy, and his father, G.E., enrolled him in piano lessons, Duke didn't want to go. Baseball was Duke's idea of fun, but his parents had other notions for their child. Duke had to start with the piano lesson, basic, piano basics, his fingers playing the same tired tune, one and two and one and two. Daisy and J.E. made Duke practice day after day. To Duke, one and two wasn't music. He called it an umpty dump sound that was headed nowhere worth following. He quit his lessons and kissed the piano a fast goodbye. Years later, on a steamy summer night, Duke heard that umpty dump played in a whole new way. Folks called the music ragtime, piano that turned umpty dump into a soul rousing romp. The ragtime music set Duke's fingers to wiggling. Soon he was back at the piano trying to plunk out his own ragtime rhythm. One and two and one and two. At first, this was the only crude tinkling Duke knew. But with practice, all Duke's fingers rode the piano keys. Duke started to play his own made-up melodies, whole notes, chords, sharps and flats, left-handed hops, and right-handed slides. Believe it, man. Duke taught himself to press on the pearlies like nobody else. His one and two umpty dump became a thing of the past. Now playing the piano was Duke's all-time love. When Duke was 19, he was entertaining ladies and gents at parties, pool halls, country clubs, and cabarets. He had fine as pie good looks, and good looks and flashy threads. He was a ladies' man with flair to spare. And whenever a pretty skinned beauty leaned on Duke's piano, he played his best music, composition, smoother than hairdo sleeked back with pomade. So he's comparing comp compositions, which are piano songs, or any music that he made up uh, being smoother than a hairdo that's leaked back with pomade, which is kind of like gel. So that's a metaphor because it doesn't use like or as, but it's still comparing. Here we go. It wasn't long before Duke formed his own small band, a group of musicians who played all over Washington, D.C., but soon they split the D.C. scene and made tracks for New York City, for Harlem, the place where jazz music ruled. They called themselves the Washingtonians and performed in all kinds of New York City honky-tonks, Barron's Exclusive, the Plantation Ciro's, uh, Ciro's, and the Kennedy Club. Folks got to know the band by name and came to hear them play. Then, on an autumn day in 1927, Lady Luck smiled pretty on the Washingtonians. They were asked to play at the Cotton Club, Harlem's swankiest hangout, a big-time night spot. The Cotton Club became a regular gig for Duke and his band. They grew to 12 musicians and charged their, changed their name to Duke Ellington and his orchestra. Night after night, they played their music, which was broadcast live over the radio.
For all those homebodies out in radio lovers land, folks who only dreamed of sitting pretty at the cotton, the show helped them feel like they were out of town, out on the town. Duke's Creole love call was spicier than a pot of jambalaya. So that's another one. It's saying that this song, Creole Love Call, was spicier than a pot of jambalaya. So it's comparing a song to a pot of jambalaya. So that is a metaphor. His mood indigo was a musical stream that swelled over the airwaves. This also because it's saying that another song which swelled, swelling refers to maybe the waves going over the airwaves, but waves as in the ocean's waves. All right. Sometimes the orchestra perform their tunes straight up, but some, but other nights. When the joint started to jump, Duke told his band to play whatever came to mind, to improvise their solos, to make music fly, and they did. Each instrument raised its own voice. One by one, each cat took the floor and wiped it clean with his own special way of playing. Sonny Greer pounded out the bang of the jump rope feet on the street with his snare drum, a subway beat on his bass drum, a sassy ride on his cymbal. Sonny's percussion was smooth and steady. Sometimes only his drumsticks made the music, cracking out the rattle, rattly beat of wood slapping wood. Along with Sonny Joe, Joe Tricky Sam Nanton went to work on his trombone, sliding smooth melodic gold. So again, his playing is being compared to melodic gold. Gold is a color, gold is gold. So to compare the two, it's a metaphor. He stretched his notes to their full lilt, pushing and pulling their tropical lilt. When Tricky Sam was through, he'd nod to Odo Toby Hardwick. Your turn, he'd say. Take the floor, daddy-o. Toby let loose on his sleek brass sax, curling his notes like a kite tail in the wind. That is a simile because it used the word like. So it's saying he's playing his saxophone and the notes are curling like a tight kite tail in the wind. A musical loop-de-loop -loop with a serious twist. Last came James Bubber Miley, a one-of-kind horn player. He could make his trumpet wail like a man whose blues were deeper than the deep blue sea. What's the key word we just heard? The word like. So he wailed like a man. Wail is a cry. So his, how he played on the trumpet was like a whale, and then, and not the whale like the animal, but whale like cry, whose blues were deeper than the deep blue sea. So the whale to how deep the sea is. To stir up the sound of his low moan horn, Bubber turned out a growl from way down in his throat. His gut bucket tunes put a spell on the room. Yeah, those solos were kicking. Hot buttered bop with lots of sassy cool tones. When the band did their thing, the Cotton Club performers danced the Black Bottom, the Fishtail, and the Susie Q. And while they were cutting the rug, Duke slid his honey-colored fingertips across the ivory 88s. 88s is how many keys a piano has. The word on Duke and his band spread from New York to Mancun to Kalamazoo and on to the shiny, sunshiny, oh my goodness, sunshiny Hollywood Hills. The whole country soon swung to Duke's beat. Once folks got a taste of Duke's soul sweet music, they hurried to the record stores asking, yo, you got the Duke? Slide me some King of the Keys, please. Gonna play me that piano prince and his band. People bought Duke's records, thousands of them. In 1939, Duke hired Billy Strayhorn, a music musician who wrote songs. Billy became Duke's ace, his main man. Billy and Duke and Billy worked as a team. Together, they composed unforgettable music. Billy's song "Take the A Train" was one of the great one of the greatest hits of 1941. With the tunes that he and Billy wrote, Duke's 
painted colors with his band sound. He could swirl the butterscotch tones of Tricky Sam's horn with the silver notes of the alto saxophone. And oh, those clarinets. Duke could blend their red hot blips with a purple dash of brass from the trumpet section. In time, folks said, in time, folks said Duke Ellington's real instrument wasn't his piano at all. It was his orchestra. Most people called him his jazz music, his music jazz, but Duke called it the music of my people. And to celebrate the history of African-American people, Duke composed a special suite he called Black, Brown, and Beige, a suite that rocked the bosom and lifted the soul. Black, Brown, and Beige sang the glories of dark skin, the pride of African heritage, and the triumphs of black people from the days of slavery to the years of civil rights struggle. Duke introduced black, brown, and beige at New York's Carnegie Hall, a symphony hall so grand that even the seats wore velvet. Few African Americans had played at Carnegie Hall before. Duke and his orchestra performed on January 23rd, 1943. Outside, the winter wind was cold and slapping, but inside, Carnegie Hall was sizzling with applause. Duke had become a master maestro. Because of Duke's genius, his orchestra now had a musical mix like no other. Now you heard of the jazz playing man, the man with the cats who could swing with his band, king of the keys, piano prince, Edward Kennedy Ellington, the Duke. And there you have it. Hope you enjoyed this book. Stay tuned for another one.